uh, mostly uh, focused on being available. Uh, we can deal with some inconsistencies later, even if it means me uh, like manual intervention. But we never want uh, our we never want to be down. We want uh, the app to be working uh, every time, every day, every minute, and that's that's challenging. Uh, so uh, what you what you're seeing on the screen is is the view of Amsterdam, uh, the city that I live in now. Uh, from Uber's point of view, you can see like the S, like the, the the brightness of the color represent, represents how often an Uber cars car drives there. So uh, yeah, um, and so our architecture uh, we have we have many servers in in geographically distributed data centers. And we have uh, a service-oriented architecture with uh, hundreds of microservices. Um, and it, it's not only about people, actually. Um, we have, uh, yeah, n no tech talk is good enough without a picture of some kitten. Um, uh, so Uber is actually uh, going into uh, the, like the last mile delivery business. Uh, we can deliver packages within cities. Uh, that's part of the Uber Rush service. Uh, we can deliver food very quickly within minutes uh, as part of the Uber Eats uh, service. And we have some like fun promotions where uh, you can, uh, like we, we agree with some animal shelter and uh, we like take some kitten from them and, and uh, people can can order an Uber car with kitten, and uh, like the money that they give them goes goes to the animal shelter, and then they also can keep the cat. So yeah, <laughs> some fun. Uh, right. Uh, so about open source, uh, our platforms are built on open source technologies everywhere. Uh, we are using Ubuntu and Debian Linux uh, on our servers. Uh, we are using a lot of Docker. Docker was a big buzzword last year. I don't know if it still is this year, but I guess it is. Uh, and uh, the main languages uh, our backend services are written in are Python, Node.js, and uh, recently Go has been gaining a lot of speed. Um, uh, our storage or like further backend services include Kafka for logging, Redis for caching, uh, Cassandra for uh, as a, as a key value storage basically, and Hadoop for uh, data analytics, and the list goes on and on. We use open source technologies everywhere, but we are not only using them. We are also contributing uh, every project, every service that uh, is created at Uber is considered for open sourcing. Of course, that does, can can happen every time. You know, there are some like business critical things that must be kept secret. Uh, sometimes it doesn't make uh, a lot of sense to open, so open source something, but if, if we can do it, we, we open source things. And uh, we have uh, about, well, more than 80 uh, original uh, public GitHub repositories, uh, also more than 40 forked repositories. Uh, and our, our software engineers are constantly contributing to, uh, to uh, projects in different ecosystems. Uh, I would say mostly in, in Node.js at this point, but like uh, contributions from our people are, uh, yeah, very often our people contribute. Um, okay, um, so this graph shows you how many microservices there are at Uber. This is uh, like a, a, a historical graph. So two, two years ago, there were no microservices. Everything was served by a monolithic uh, API service. Uh, and, but since then, since then with the, like, the number of microservices ex has exploded, we now have over 700 microservices running at Uber. And uh, even keeping them running you know, is, uh, is a challenging thing. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about three things that uh, support this microservice-oriented architecture. Uh, the first is StringPop, which is uh, scalable, fault-tolerant toler application-level sharding. 
you will see what it is in a minute. Uh, T-channel, high performance, uh, RPC, uh, and Hyperban, uh, service discovery and routing uh, for our large scale, large scale service oriented architecture operations. All right, uh, so Ringpop. Uh, Ringpop is actually the project that uh, we are developing in Amsterdam. Uh, so Ringpop cons consists of two main things. Uh, it's, a, it's a consistent hashing ring and a membership protocol. Consistent hashing allows us to, to consistently ha shard uh, requests uh, to, to the workers that actually uh, do, uh, do the business logic. So imagine uh, you, have a, you have a trip that's, that's, uh, that has started, the trip has an ID, and you, because the trip is full of state, you know, and you want, uh, you, you're doing some caching, you want the cache to be fresh, so you want that one request be routed to the, to the one host, to the one instance, and that one instance uh, is, is going to handle the, the whole trip. And you can imagine that the supply service, for example, or the demand service that we have are being served on hundreds of hosts. There are hundreds of instances, and we need to we need to route these requests consistently to one machine that is going to handle that one trip, and then you know it can do, it can do other things. And uh, if of course we want to be available, so if that machine fails, we want this failure to be uh, non-disruptive. Uh, we want the trip to to still continue, right? If the machine crashes, we cannot afford to lose the trip. Uh, and a membership protocol a membership protocol uh, gives us. Uh, uh, fault detection in a decentralized way, uh, in a scalable way. So we will see how these two things come together. Uh, so I will dig, dig a little deep into the underlying technology. Uh, so uh, uh, a hashing ring is actually like a, like a continuous or like a, a, a basically a four byte integer. Uh, uh, so uh, the first thing we need to do, we are, we are basically placing workers on, on this hashing ring and, or instances as we call them. And then uh, as the requests come in, we route them uh, to these instances uh, based, on, based on hashing. So first thing we need to do, we need to place uh, these, uh, these instances uh, on the hashing ring. So here, uh, these uh, we have three inst instances A, B, and C, and we've uh, we've run them through a hashing function that is going to be just return a four byte uh, uh, integer, and that places places them on on the hashing ring. Um, this this uh, determines the key space division, so uh, every instance is responsible for the for the keys for the hashing keys that are counterclockwise until the next uh, uh, next instance. So, in in this case, instance B is is responsible for the uh, left half of the key space, and instances B and C have split the right part right path right part of the key space. Um, in reality, it's a little more complicated than this. Uh, it it actually never happens that like this would be this imbalanced, but for the sake of simplicity, let's let's assume it's kind of disbalanced, but it, in reality, it's not. Um, OK. Uh, and now, uh, if, we want to, if we want to determine uh, which instance is uh, responsible for a given user, for example, or a given trip, we hash the user or the trip, and it falls somewhere on the ring. Uh, in this case, users 1 and 5 have fallen on, onto, are, are, uh, being, will be handled by, uh, by instance B. And the same way, users, uh, user 8 is going to be handled by instance C, and user 4 is going to be handled by instance A. Uh, and uh, now, let's say instance C has, has caught fire, you know, like it's down. Somebody has cut the cable. And we need uh, this, uh, this thing to cause as few disruptions as possible. So. Uh, our membership protocol determines that that instance C is down. It removes it from the ring, and now instance A is responsible f also for user uh, user eight uh, because C is no longer part of the ring. 
And, uh, but as you can see, uh, users 1 and 5 are still being handled by instance B. So uh, unless uh, the instance goes down, uh, uh, n the request is going to be routed to the same instance every time. And in the other case, if we put another instance in the ring, in this case D, uh, it's going to take over some of A's key space and user 4 is now being handled by instance D. So the important thing to remember again, unless something goes wrong, uh, the request is always being handled by one instance from start to beginning, uh, from, from beginning to the end. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, and now how we, how we do the membership protocol. So uh, our membership protocol is based on SWIM. Uh, if you've never heard of it, go read the SWIM paper. It's, it's an excellent paper. Uh, I really recommend it. It's, it really, yeah, it's a great read. Do it. Uh, so uh, this is, this is uh, we are assuming we have three instances and we somehow want to keep uh, the membership and we want to keep it in a de decentralized, scalable way and SWIM uh, allows us to do this. Um, so in the steady state, uh, these instances uh, cycle through their membership list and randomly in given intervals ping uh, their neighbor, neighbors. Uh, and if nothing happens, they just happily ping and uh, everything is fine, you know. Uh, but if instance B uh, goes down uh, and instance A decides, uh, it, like tries to ping it, it doesn't get a response back. Uh, so, uh, but we don't know, you know, like sometimes packets get, get lost on the network. It might be just a temporary thing, you know. We don't want to jump to conclusion that instance B is down. So we want to be, we want to be sure. Uh, so what happens is that instance A asks instance uh, asks another instance in this instant, in this case instance C to do uh, what is called an indirect ping. It sends a ping request to instance C, and instance C pings uh, instance B on A's behalf. And uh, so this uh, this is for the case where you know like a link between A and B has been broken, but still uh, the link between C and B is fine, so we don't want to mark uh, B as faulty because it's still there, just, just A cannot reach B, but that's not, not, a, not a big problem. So uh, the indirect ping, uh, yeah, the indirect ping fails and now A declares uh, B as suspect. That means uh, it's not yet declared faulty, you know, it could be just a temporary failure. We don't want to be causing many disruption un unless that disruptions unless it's really necessary. So it's just been declared suspect and, but after some time, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I forgot something. Um, so uh, what's important here is that uh, this protocol is based on uh, what we call gossiping, uh, that is, in, this, in these pings, we, we gossip or like we piggyback, what we call it, uh, information about the membership uh, to other instances. So the next time A pings C, it also, the ping uh, carries the information that B has been declared suspect. Uh, and so in the next ping, uh, uh, the information that, that B is declared suspect goes to, goes to instance C. And after some, after a little while, you know, when B doesn't doesn't respond back, it's declared it's actually declared faulty. Um, so uh, the the best thing about this approach is that it's it's uh, it's very scalable. Uh, think it, it's doing uh, what we call inf infection style dissemination. It it doesn't. Uh, it, it goes randomly. It randomly disseminates information about membership, and but this this uh, this this random infection style dissemination eventually 
get to all the nodes. Uh, but the beautiful thing about this is that the, the traffic is constant per node. So that we, when we grow the cluster, uh, nodes don't need to uh, don't don't need to keep connections to every other uh, node there is. They just they just uh, they just they are just pinging some you know some subset like in in constant intervals. So it's it's very scalable, and. Uh, we have we have we have clusters with 1,000 instances in production. We have tested it to 2,500 instances, and we just don't have enough hardware at this point to 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 go further. But we we think it's going to be fine up to up to 10,000 instances of this running. So that's 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 something about the scale of Uber. Like we, we have service that has 1,000 instances uh, in production. OK, um, so how does, how does RingPop actually, uh, how, how, do, how, how does one use RingPop? So RingPop is an application level middleware. middleware. Um, requests uh, come, uh, come into the service. Uh, RingPop, based on the hashing ring and the membership, decides whether it should handle the request or forward it to <coughs> part. To some uh, to some other instance, and um, so you can imagine something like this. This is just pseudocode. Don't like look too closely at it. Uh, so if you look at the diagram in the bottom, you know uh, these are our three instances. A request for user one comes to instance A. Instance A is not the owner of of the uh, of the of the u of the user uh, based on the consistent hashing, so it forwards it to, but it knows where it should go immediately, so it forwards it to to instance uh, C, and instance C handles it and uh, uh, replies through uh, instance A and sends the response. So this is what the code could could look like for some kind of business logic on on users. Um, So you have seen that uh, there's a lot of RPC happening, you know, many services, many, many uh, pings happening, many, uh, many requests and flying, responses flying around. And uh, we, have, we, have, we used to use HTTP, but um, there were uh, many issues with it. Uh, HTTP is a complex protocol. Um, it's kind of slow performing in some cases, so uh, we came up with with our uh, the yeah. There was a need to uh, to make something something more reliable, faster, uh, and so uh, we created T channel. Uh, T channel was created with uh, the service oriented architecture in mind from from the start. So you are not calling hosts; you are calling services. Um, we can do. Uh, we wanted to be able to trace any requests re request in our service-oriented architecture, so that we can do uh, we can per we can do diagnostics, uh, we can do performance testing, and tracing of the requests. Um, we want it to be easy to implement in the languages that we use. Uh, also, we wanted it to support multiplexing. That is, you can you can have one connection open and send many uh, requests. You don't have to uh, wait for the response as you as you would uh, need with HTTP. With HTTP, you can work around it by using multiple connections, but then you're using more connections and uh, it's not as scalable. We wanted it to support arbitrary serial serialization. Um, uh, we still use a lot of JSON, but uh, the problem with JSON is that it's, it's slow to uh, parse and produce. We have found that our, many of our services were, were basically doing one thing all day, and that is like parsing and, and producing JSON. So, so we actually uh, started using Thrift, which is uh, 
a different serialization uh, uh, approach. Uh, and we wanted, of course, it to support uh, high performance forwarding because that's that's what we do what we do a lot, as you have seen. Uh, so T channel is a is a binary protocol, and uh, it's it's binary because based uh, we can we 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 know fixed there are fixed points in in it's in the T channel header that we can access directly without needing of any difficult or complicated parsing, and based on these headers in fixed positions uh, in the byte stream, we can determine the, the forwarding. We don't need to parse the whole request, request in any way, so that allows, uh, that allows the very fast forwarding. Uh, and yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a request ID, which actually allows us to do do the tracing I described. We can just trace any request by its ID throughout the whole network. Uh, yeah, so again, T channel is open source. We have four implementations in Node.js, Python, Go, and Java. And we've also built tools uh, to support it. T curl does, yeah, uh, it, it's just cur curl for T channel. And T cap uh, allows us to, uh, to trace and diagnose uh, uh, T channel. Uh, requests as they fly through the network. Um, yeah, and of course, if we have a large service-oriented architecture operation, uh, you need some way to to do service discovery and routing on this large scale. So that it's one thing to have one service that is like nicely working and it's reliable and it uses consistent hashing and everything is working fine, but you need a way to to communicate between these these uh, services, so that's where Hyperbrand comes in. Uh, Hyperbrand gives us uh, service discovery, uh, request forwarding. It uh, clients have to do almost zero configuration. You just need to give it one uh, Hyperbrand instance, and it will bootstrap uh, automatically. IP address of one Hyperbrand instance, and it will uh, bootstrap automatically. And uh, also, uh, Hyperbrand allows us to do circuit breaking. That means if one service is misbehaving, it doesn't respond, we can, uh, we can cut traffic to it so that it doesn't disrupt uh, services that are downstream to it or upstream. And also allows us to do rate limiting if, again, uh, one service is misbehaving, uh, is producing many requests, we want to limit it dynamically so that, again, it doesn't disrupt more of our architecture. Uh, so Ringpop, uh, pardon, Hyperban is, is actually based on Ringpop. Uh, the Hyperban uh, routers form a ring and services uh, connect to this ring. Uh, services do not connect to every node in, in the hyperbound ring. They just have a subset of them, which we call an affinity group. Uh, and uh, so, so you can imagine service, uh, when the service starts, it contacts one of the hyperbound nodes, and the hyperbound node tells it uh, where it should connect, where its affinity group is, and it connects there. And then uh, it's it's ready to to uh, to to respond to requests. So this is uh, what a, a request flow could look like in Hyperban. Um, so service A uh, connects to to Hyperban. Uh, Hyperban uh, and, and basically service A wants to wants wants to do a request to service B. Yeah, that's that's the goal. So service A sends, uh, sends the request to Hyperban. Hyperban uh, this determines where, the, where service B's uh, affinity group is, forwards the request to, to, to one of the routers in, uh, in the B's affinity group, and then forwards it to service B. Service B, again, determines where, uh, where it should actually handle the request, forwards it to the correct instance, and then the whole thing goes back. So you can see there's a lot of routing happening and it's, it's uh, and forwarding happening. And that's only thanks to T channel that we can do this in a high performance way. So, um, conclusion. Uh, 
Uber is uh, both open source user and contributor. Uh, we have uh, a large service-oriented architecture based on our open source projects. You can, there's, there's good doc documentation. You can really go to GitHub, take a look, play with it. Uh, these projects are Ringpop, T Channel, and Hyperband. There's plenty, plenty more there. And we still, but we still have a lot of interesting challenges ahead. You know, uh, we've been around for uh, like four or five years, something like that. Our architecture is still evolving. Uh, and yeah, so things will change, things will break, but uh, a lot of interesting stuff is happening. So, um, thank you. Uh, yeah, Uber is hiring if you want to work on this and more cool stuff, uh, get in touch with me. Also, if you, want to, uh, if you want to take an Uber, you still don't have an account, you can use uh, a promo code Marek for you to get 250 crowns of your first ride. Um, yeah, so. That's all from me. I'm ready to answer any questions you may have. All right. Uh, yeah, I think you were first. I have two very quick questions. Yeah. One, do you have any Paxos or RAS implementations also that can be really from the source? And secondly, I uh, imagine you must collect a lot of data running Uber. So what are you doing with this data? Are you selling it or are you <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, uh, the first question was, do we use some kind of uh, Raft or Pexos implementation? Uh, answer is, um, <laughs> answer is, uh, kinda, like we, we use Cassandra and uh, we used uh, React, which are both based on these things, but we don't have anything in-house based on, on these two. So, uh, kind of. Uh, and the second question was, we collect a lot of data. What are, we, what are we doing with the data? Are we selling it or not? So we are definitely not selling the data. Uh, as you, like, actually, uh, yeah, we have a big uh, Hadoop operation. We are anal analyzing a lot of data, but we are definitely not selling the data, no. What do you, what do, you do about that? Um, <laughs> Um, so you can imagine that, uh, um, okay, uh, I'm not sure I can actually like talk about it a lot. But, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, like there's, there's a lot of space for, for optimization in routing, for example, you know, like of the cars and, uh, yeah. Uh, that's that's about everything I can probably say here. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, th I think yeah. Thank you. When you say user as a piece of the hash, yeah. what, do mean, what attribute? Which attributes do you mean? Is that a, I assume that's not a username. Is that an IP address or? Yeah, yeah. So so uh, we work with uh, UUIDs uh, throughout. Yeah, sure. Uh, the question was. Uh, how do we determine the identity of the user, basically? Yeah, so we don't use usernames. We, every user is associated with a UUID. So uh, we use these UUIDs as, as uh, the source for the hashing. Right. Uh, yeah? Can you talk about security and encryption? Yeah. Uh, question was about security and encryption with the channel. Uh, this is all happening internally. Uh, we don't do any encryption on the application layer. Uh, I believe there are there there are uh, IPsec things happening, you know, like in in the lower layers of the network. But uh, yeah, you you wouldn't use the channel to connect from your cell phone to uh, to uh, to our infrastructure. We use we still use HTTP and REST based. Uh, approach to, to to get to the end device. Yeah. So is that, that note takes care for example for one ride 
Yeah. And if, uh, if dies, uh, another node take over, yeah. what happens in the background? We probably have to replicate the data. So you use custom graphic or you, it's uh, stateless or it's something yeah. that's found stateful and replicate data as the player come. Yeah, uh, so so the question was, uh, what happens if the die if the <laughs> if the node actually dies uh, in bit in the middle of the trip? How do we like load the state? Um, so there's a couple of things we do. Uh, one, we use uh, we use uh, Redis for caching. So you you would stay the transient state in in Redis as as one place, or we have a couple of uh, uh, st storage uh, services uh, based on Cassandra, based on React, that where we store the data uh, so that it can be loaded uh, in case the node dies. Okay, so basically, when the data comes, uh, it's uh, immediately stored. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 yes, yes. So, so, so the advantage there is that like your your caches are are fresh, mm -hmm. uh, and also there are, there are other services which, which only store. Uh, Really transient data that get that get refreshed every couple of seconds. So uh, if if the if the node uh, if one of the instances dies, the data gets gets refreshed from from the source very quickly. So like we, we get like a four second or something like that disruption, but it's 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 like not not a not a big deal. Yeah. Uh, well, so the question was: Is is there any guarantee that the requests uh, get where they are supposed to go? Uh, the answer is uh, um, no. Uh, you know, like you can you can always lose the packets uh, somewhere in the network, but what you can do is. Uh, do you can do speculative execution that is uh, you actually ask two instances for some some request and you use the first response that comes in uh, so that if one of the packets is some some lost somewhere you still get the second one uh, you can also uh, wait for the responses and if it doesn't doesn't come in you repeat it but then of course you are uh, faced with some latency issues yeah so yeah uh, there are ways to to work around this, but of course, if you know if a packet is lost somewhere in in mid in like in the cable, you know it get just gets stuck in the cable. No, yeah, so you need. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 thanks thanks to the, thanks to the fact that we have request IDs, yeah. we can we can uh, we know that we have like we sent a request with an ID. And we are waiting for a response with an ID. So if the response doesn't come in, we can safely resend the request. Because the, the destination service knows that it already served it, so it can like say, send the same response again. You know, so we, we can guarantee that it's going to handle the request only once. And as, as well, we can, we, can, we can guarantee that the, that the source service is going to handle the response only once. Thanks to the IDs. Yeah. Can you elaborate more on how you deal with recovery? For example, if customers compile device to refresh and then refresh. Or you lose connection between your data So, uh, yeah. Well, what, what used to happen is that. Uh, Devices would basically ping our data center every couple of seconds, and they would get 
the whole state of the application back and it will just display the state. But we are, we are kind of moving away from this approach. So the mobile application knows what, uh, what data it should request and it just asks the, uh, our backend services for the data and if the connection gets broken, your application won't update for a couple of seconds, but when the collection, connection uh, comes back, it will just load the data that is necessary. Uh, so, so um, there. Um, well, I, I don't think there, there's a big room for conflicts, really. The, the application is fairly simple, actually. So you just when when you make a request to to uh, to to get a car, you you just like you know commit uh, with pressing the button, the request either gets to the server or it doesn't. And if it gets there, it's get, it gets processed on the server and you will never, like, you wouldn't uh, send the request twice. So, you know, like, there's, I don't, I don't feel, I don't think there's a lot of room for conflicts, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so the first question is, Hyperbahn is written in Node.js, why, why didn't we choose Go, uh, basically? Uh, uh, Node.js at the time was the, the language to, to write things in. At Uber, there were, uh, there were software engineers able to write things in Node.js, so that's the basic reason. Uh, and the second question, yeah, yeah, did we have problems with Node.js? Yes. yes. So, yes, we, we've had problems. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's why actually Go is gaining a lot of speed at Uber now. Are you considering rewriting it to something else or it just make sure stable robust enough for you? Uh, uh, we are considering all options. So un unfortunately, we are really out of time. So thanks, Mark, for the great talk. Yeah. Why didn't we uh, write Hyperbound? Why didn't we use uh, some like out of the box 